ാണ് <laughs>
Uh, respected uh, dignitaries of IMI, uh, Dr. Suresh sir, uh, Dr. Rajkumar sir, uh, and uh, other esteemed uh, members of IMI, and all my seniors here and my colleagues. My myself, Dr. Ashwin, I work as a ENT consultant in Sri Chen Specialty Hospital, Kano. So when IMI uh, people approach me for a uh, particular topic for any weekly CME, I was just thinking uh, what should I present from an ENT perspective. So I was thinking vertigo would be a general and a very common uh, symptoms most of us see in our day to day practice. I mean, most of us are maybe uh, uh, felt also the same, like most of us have felt dizzy at some point of our life. Maybe it's a uh, ear process, maybe it's something related to other pseudo vertigos like. Uh, Increasing copy, lightheadedness, etc. So I thought uh, we'll just give a glimpse regarding how do we, as an ENT specialist, we go about a patient when they come with uh, dizziness. So like, like there's a classic movie by uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, which deals with these symptoms. Although they are not exactly saying that spinning sensation, but something related to the fear of height and all. So I thought just I'll mention it was. From this uh, film, it's a classic movie named uh, Vertigo. So the little knowledge I have regarding this uh, topic and this uh, uh, Vertigo, I owe to my teachers in my alma mater, uh, All India Institute of Medical Science, no really. So I just remember them with a lot of gratefulness. So approach to a vertiginous patient. So when a patient comes to our uh, OPD, patient will be saying, uh, I am busy. So most of the time we feel that uh, patient is having dizziness. So we need to ask few questions. We need to find out what is exactly that uh, happening to the patient. Why is he, he or her, she is having a, a vertigo or a dizziness. So it's kind of a deceit to that uh, clinician also. I mean, we get confused at times. So before going into the topic as such, I would like to say two cases, which so far, uh, uh, case of interest here. The two case scenarios, one is a case one patient. He's a 50 year old male hypertensive patient. He woke up in the morning and he had an acute uh, onset dizziness while he getting up from the bed. So he was referring, there is no spinning sensation. Uh, there was a continuous dizziness. He was not able to get up from the bed. As soon as you try to get up from the bed, uh, he just uh, uh, fell back. And he had a very unsteady walking, was not able to walk at all. I mean, he tried walking, but he couldn't. He fell down and he has lied down into his bed. And he had very severe nausea and vomiting, but he does not uh, report any hearing loss or tinnitus. And another case, and a 54-year-old male without any comorbidity, he also had a similar kind of a vertigo when he got up from the bed, but he had a spinning sensation. He felt like the entire room is spinning. And uh, that spinning sensation has worsened when he turned his head to right side and when he tried to tilt back his head. But he was able to walk with support and uh, there was a very bad nausea and vomiting. He had a multiple episode of vomiting. He also reported uh, no hearing loss or tinnitus. So what is the likely localization in each case? And through the slides, we will come into the conclusion. So when a patient comes to us with having this kind of dizziness, First thing we should see is whether he is having actual vertigo or not, or he is just having a pseudo vertigo or a, uh, not a true vertigo. So once you have gone to that, then the next will be whether he is having a very acute emergency kind of a condition like a central vertigo or he is having a benign condition called a peripheral vertigo. And less important is like what is the pathophysiological mechanism or what is the etiology. We need to know that, but not much into detail. Vertigo as such, it's uh, derived from the word Latin word called vertere and ego is actually a condition of turning about. By medical dictionary, the definition of uh, vertigo is, is a hallucination of self or an environmental movement or a loss of uh, spatial orientation. Most commonly we felt it as a feeling of spinning. It's typically due to disturbance in the vestibular system. So definition says vertigo means there is something wrong with the patient uh, vestibular system. So dizziness is actually a common uh, description for many different uh, 
feeling the patient comes to sick. They might say, it's, I'm busy, or they might say, I'm very giddy. So just a brief regarding the anatomy. And uh, we all know that uh, ear does the two main purpose. One is hearing and one is maintaining the balance of the patient. So it's actually the inner ear which is responsible for that. And uh, we know that there are three semicircular canals. One is superior or anterior. And we have a posterior canal here and lateral or horizontal canal here. And the autolithic organs, which are otherwise called as utricle and sacu. And this inner ear, that is a labyrinth, which is responsible for patient, I mean, a, a person's uh, balance. And this is the microanatomy. I'm not going into the detail. So these are the semicircular canals and the autolithic organs, which actually detect a patient movement, whether he is having a rotation of the head, whether he's having a linear acceleration that he is moving forward, or whether he's having a head tilt. And the stimulation of this semicircular canal actually produces a eye movement in that plane. So this is the vestibular pathway. I mean, we have an inner ear here, which detects the patient uh, uh, head movement and it sent its signals through his cranial nerve eight, vestibular cochlear nerve to the vestibular nucleus, which is situated in the medulla. And from the vestibular nucleus, it is uh, signaling to the other higher centers of the brain and it has multiple tract. I mean, uh, you'll see in the next slide, we have a tract called the vestibular ocular tract. Actually, it gives supplies through that, uh, uh, to the supply through the medial, uh, uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus through its ascending component. It has supplies into three main uh, cranial nerve nuclei, like this cranial nerve three, oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerve, which is responsible for the vestibular ocular reflex. And it also gives supplies to the vestibular spinal pathway through the descending component of uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus. And there is another component called vestibular cerebellar pathway through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And the cerebellum, which is the actual integrating center for maintaining a patient uh, uh, balance. So is it a vertigo or something else? That would be the next question. So when a patient comes with acute dizziness, we will be asking the patient, what do you feel? So patient may say, I feel like uh, having a spinning sensation and my room is spinning or myself I am spinning. Or he felt like there's a false sensation of motion. Sometimes the patient can have very vague symptoms, like uh, he just felt like uh, disconnected from the environment. He has a loss of consciousness. He might have a blackout. He feel like uh, I might pass out at any time. And sometimes they say that I have a very balance issue. I'm not able to walk properly. I feel like the entire ground is wobbly. I feel like I'm standing on a boat. It is moving in and around. And another part is a non-specific business. And we are seeing that this non-specific dizziness comes to be like very common. I mean, the patient comes to you and he asks him, what do you feel? Do you feel like spinning? They say, yes. And we ask them, do you feel like we'll pass out? They say, yes. And we ask them, do you feel like uh, you're feeling the entire thing is wobbly and shaking? They say, yes. So it's kind of a confusing to us. So these three sensations, mainly vertigo, light headiness, and a disequilibrium, they have their own definition. And I already mentioned that. And there will be some frequently associated symptoms with that. For vertigo, they will have a very bad nausea or a vomiting. And light fitness or pre syncope, they feel like the body is warm or the body is cold. And they might feel like some free visual changes are there. And this is because of the transient reduction of the cerebral perfusion, maybe a transient ischemic attack. And in disequilibrium, it, because patient may feel that I will frequent fall without a loss of consciousness, they may be because of multiple sensory deficits. So vertigo as such will be pointing to our semicircular canal and a neuro and a spine center. Disequilibrium, multiple factors. Vestibular migraine is one of the factor. Medication may be a cause. Peripheral neuropathy is another cause. Posterior column syndrome, vitamin B12 deficiency, and even a Parkinsonism patient can have a disequilibrium. And pre syncope is normally related to vascular anemia or a cardiac arrhythmia and hyperventilation or any metabolic syndrome. And lightheadedness, as I said, patient may have an anxiety or a uh, psychiatric disorder or depression. You feel like they are anxious and lightheaded. So there are a lot of differential for a patient with the dizziness. There are a lot cerebrovascular causes. There are inner ear disorders, infectious, inflammatory, metabolic, cardiovascular, traumatic. A lot of causes. I mean, listing these causes itself is a bit busy for us. So how do we conclude to? I mean, when a patient comes to with an acute dizziness, 
and how can we narrow down to a particular diagnosis so that we don't miss that uh, most alarming uh, uh, posterior circulation stroke. So we know that the patient says they are having a spinning sensation. So we know it's a vertigo, it's not, not like headiness or a disequilibrium. So next would be our question would be what is the type, whether it is central or it is peripheral. So the first we start with an examination. I mean, the complete general physical examination is required along with a detailed neuro examination. The detailed neuro examination is very important here because most of the patients with the central causes, acute causes with the posterior cerebellar stroke, I mean, posterior circulation stroke with the cerebellar infarction or a stroke, patient will have a lot of other focal neurological deficits like ataxia, there will be some cerebellar signs positive, etc. So a detailed neurological examination is essential when a patient comes with an acute dizziness, acute vertigo. And along with, we need to examine his ear. I mean, we look for any ear finding, ear, ear, ear infection. He does not have any acute otitis media, does not have any viral exanthema, like uh, patient can have herpes social orticals that can present with vertigo. So we need to examine his ear, look for any vesicles, look, look at his palate, look for any vesicles, etc. And the local examination. Local examination is actually pertaining to the vertigo examination. The, the detailed neurological examination, as I said, there are no, multiple uh, focal neurological deficit, uh, particular to a uh, different insult to different uh, sites of uh, vestibular pathway. And patient can have a dysarthria, dysphagia, or across uh, sensory sign or Horner syndrome present when they have a problem in their brainstem. And in a year, they can have a hearing loss. And isolated uh, cerebellar, in fact, can have a ataxia as the classical symptoms. And the pawn's involvement can have hemiparesis, facial weakness, gaze paralysis, et cetera. And higher central can have hemisensory deficit and a cognitive deficit. So a detailed neurological examination is very essential in the case of an acute business. Case. So another important uh, criteria to differentiate between a central and a peripheral course will be like uh, based on the HINS examination, which I will be explaining later. And that uh, the physiology behind that is, we all know there's a doll's eye movement called a vestibular ocular reflex. That means when you turn your head to the one side the, and the eye try to fixate onto the, when you ask the patient to fixate on one point and try to turn the head, the eyes try to fixate uh, in a particular point by action of two important muscles. One is that contralateral uh, lateral oblique muscle and the ipsilateral medial rectus. How does, how does it happen actually? So when a patient turns his head to one side and that uh, semicircular canal, the head tilt will be recorded by semicircular canals and uh, more precisely by the uh, autolithic organs. They send the signal through the uh, cranial nerve eight into vestibular nuclei and through that multiple connection, which have ex multiple uh, uh, ascending neurological pathway, which I've explained before, they send signal to cranial nerve nucleus. That means to the other eye, contralateral eye, they, through the cranial nerve six, they supply they give the lateral, uh, uh, to the cranial nerve six, they supply the abducens nerve and they will be causing a medial uh, rotation. And, uh, and through the ipsilateral ocular motor uh, nerve, they cause a uh, uh, contralateral uh, medial rotation. So this doll's eye movement or a vestibular ocular reflex is the basis for a head impulse test, which is essential to do in a patient with acute dizziness. In a head impulse test, we can easily differentiate between the patient is having an acute central cause or having an acute peripheral cause. And what do we actually do in a head impulse test? We ask the patient to fix his vision into one particular point, either that the clinician's nose or you can ask the patient to fix it over his eyebrow or anywhere. And we will quickly turn the head to one side. So a patient who is having a problem in his peripheral uh, vestibular area, like a peripheral vestibular body, that what happens is I actually follows the head movement. I know I eyes are not able to fixate to that particular uh, uh, point. So there will be some corrective saccades movement. The eyes will be continuously, uh, continuously beating to fixate his eye on a particular uh, target. That, typically happens in case of a peripheral vestibular system because the vestibular ocular reflex, which is being mediated by the peripheral vestibular area like semicircular canal, vestibular nerve, vestibular nuclei is being impaired here. So patient will have a positive head impulse test when he having a peripheral vestibular body, which is actually a reassuring for us. 
because a patient does not have a, a positive inverse test that means there is some some problem in his uh, higher centers in case of a patient with acute dizziness so head impulse is a must do test when a patient comes with an acute dizziness and another important test what we need to do is to look for its nystagmus the central and the peripheral courses have a different type of nystagmus nystagmus in a peripheral courses will be having a unidirectional nystagmus that means if the patient is having a right side uh, either having a bpv or a vestibular neuritis that is a peripheral course and when we ask the patient to look into the ipsilateral side the right side patient will having a have a single i mean one side breathing i mean right side breathing nystagmus that will be always in the direction when you ask the patient to look on the other side he will not have a breathing he will not have a nystagmus to that side that means it would be an unidirectional nystagmus the directional nystagmus is usually he usually identified through the direction of the fast component because we will have a fast component it will have a slow component and direction will be always towards this fast component but unlike a central course which will have a different atypical kind of a nystagmus that normally have a bidirectional nystagmus we ask the patient to look into the left side patient will have a nystagmus to that side when we ask the patient to look on the right side patient will have nystagmus to that side so bidirectional nystagmus is the typical of central course of vertigo or it may have very atypical like vertical vertical nystagmus or a torsional nystagmus or a very pure horizontal nystagmus so nystagmus as i said is a very important clinical sign one is a unidirectional nystagmus another is a bidirectional nystagmus we need to differentiate between the two another test is uh, test for skew that means cover and uncover test this also detect test the central uh, vestibular pathway and whether the patient is having any lesion or any pathology in the central uh, area so we ask the we in front sitting in front of the patient we cover his eyes for one few seconds ask the patient to fix it at one particular point we cover it for few seconds and then we move shift to the other other eye so in a normal patient he will be fixating with his other eye when he try to move from one eye to another but a patient with having a central course like having a cerebellar stroke or something they will have some vertical movement of his eyebrow that will be a vertical a uh, vertical skew that we say vertical malalignment of this eye bone that is typically suggestive of a central course so these three tests actually the part of kins examination that is a head impulse nystagmus and a test for skew so if we have a post in a peripheral vertigo and central vertigo as i already said so in a central vertigo it will have a normal head impulse test no corrective sockets will be seen and a nystagmus will be bidirectional or atypical or a patient will have a vertical skew deviation but we do not have all these three present for to find out having a central vertigo even one of these positive finding is very alarming patient may not have an head impulse test positive sorry patient may not having a bidirectional nystagmus but patient can have a skew deviation present in that case also we need to suspect the central cause of vertigo and there have been studies which have said this hins test alone can identify uh, having a good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing a case of acute cerebellar stroke acute cerebellar stroke although is very rare it comprises only of 2 to 3% of a total cerebrovascular stroke that comes to an emergency physician although it is very rare we should not miss that with a peripheral vertigo and this hins examination have a better sensitivity than an early mri that is a diffusion weighted mri it is very specific for identifying a stroke or any other focal neurological deficit or even a head ct the ct has very low sensitivity around the 20 to 30 percentage for detection of an acute uh, cerebellar stroke so the same has been uh, mentioned in one of the uh, path breaking journal path breaking uh, article in a stroke journal which has said uh, this hins exam alone has got a 100% sensitivity and uh, 96% specificity compared to a diffusion weighted mri which has only 72% of sensitivity to detect uh, central uh, courses of vertigo so this three clinical examination if you do for properly in a acutely dizzy patient we can easily identify a patient having a central vertigo or a cerebellar stroke another test that we not normally do is a vestibular spinal test we must have all done this rombus test that we see just to see whether the patient is able to maintain a balance when he keep his feet close and he keep his uh, uh, arm close and try to close his eyes so actually when a patient try to stand with there are three sensory inputs one from the visual one from the proprioception from his joints and the nerves 
and one from the vestibular. So by doing a different maneuvers like eyes open, we are keeping all the sensory input intact and we ask the patient to close his eyes so his visual sensation is gone. So he's typically maintaining on his uh, proprioceptive sensation and a vestibular sensation. And by converting the surface where he stands from the firm surface into the compliant surface, that may be like you can compare with a cone standing over a cotton, that will be a compliant surface. So when you're standing on a compliant surface, that proprioception will be gone in that case. So only visual and vestibular will be there. So an ideal way to assess only the vestibular sensory input, we should ask the patient to close his eyes and we should have a compliant surface, but we will not, not have that most of, we will not having this kind of a surface in our day-to-day -day practice. Just for a theoretical knowledge also. So going back to our case, case one and case two, and we have examined the patient. And the case one, he had a negative head impulse test and direction changing nystagmus he had, and he had an absence cue, but, and he had a very bad uh, vomiting, frontal attacks. Uh, he tried to get up from his bed, but it's sitting, but he could not sit up. He has suddenly falls down, and he does not have a neurological deficit. And case two, he had a positive head impulse test, right beating single direction, uh, horizontal nystagmus, no skew, and there is no neurological deficit. So case one, point to a central cause, could be a cerebral stroke, and case two, point to a peripheral cause, it may be a vestibular neuritis. So this, and central vertigo can have other findings, as I already explained, dysarthria, diplopia, patient can have paresthesia, auras like symptoms, and they always have a typical risk factors of vascular disease. They may be old patient, they have a metabolic syndrome, or they have a hypertension, they may have a diabetes, or they have some pre-existing illness, they have family history of vascular disease, etc. In that case, we should have higher suspicion for having a central vertigo. And peripheral vertigo as such will have a very good compensation. I mean, the patient comes with a peripheral vertigo, the other vestibular system will try to compensate this for its uh, Lows the uh, whichever side has lost its vestibular function, but on the other hand, central vertigo will not have a compensation. That means, in clinically, if you say a patient comes to you having a vertigo, and uh, we try that uh, canal reposition maneuver, the Dixalpic and a please maneuver that we normally do, and the patient is getting better with that without any vestibular sedative. Patient is having a good compensation. One week after that first visit, patient comes to you and says, I am better now, I'm not having any rotation or spinning type of, that means the body is trying to compensate it. Other vestibular side is going to compensate it. That indicates he is having a peripheral problem. But on the other hand, even if you miss it on the first hand, next week the patient comes and still say, I'm still feeling very giddy. I'm not able to get up, I'm not able to go to bathroom, I'm not able to move around. That means the body is not compensating it. So that would point to a central cause. And peripheral vertigo, that is more common than a central vertigo. And peripheral vertigo, the few main causes are like uh, BPPV, it is an Meniere's disease, pedilin fistula, labyrinthitis, and Cogan syndrome, which can come with optic neuritis. And the vestibular nerve causes like vestibular neuritis, vestibular schanoma may be very rare though, and ramsey hunt syndrome or a herp herpes uh, zoster opticals. Central causes may be a stroke or a TAA, or a posterior fissa, fossa hemorrhage, or a non-muscular causes like it can present with the multiple sclerosis or even with the vestibular migraine. Vestibular migraine can be fit into a peripheral causes as well. So in patient with an acute dizziness, we might find out whether the patient is having a continuous vertigo or the patient is having an episodic vertigo. And another case is the patient is having a very spontaneous vertigo or which has triggered by some head movements or something. So when a patient with a continuous spontaneous vertigo without having any triggering. Triggering factor will be most commonly by, by head movements or head tilt to one side, or you try to turn to one side kind of a thing. And having a continuous vertigo, our diagnosis will be vertebrobasilar stroke or a posterior fossa hemorrhage. And in a vertebrobasilar stroke, we'll have an acute continuous vestibular body. It will be commonly in older patients, person 60 or 70 mostly, and they will have some muscular risk factors and usually have their good hearing and does not have any tinnitus. Will have a negative head impulse test. They have a central type nystagmus bidirectional. They have a vertical skew present and will have manifest with uh, focal neurological findings like cerebellar stroke, isolated vertigo, they may not present, very rare. And most of the time they're present with other neurological findings. That's why the complete uh, detailed neurological examination is important for an acute disease patient. And uh, they have other uh, localizing signs like uh, dysmetria, gait instability, etc. 
and the most common culprit would be like posterior cerebellar uh, artery which having a bleeding and it is uh, in fact or hemorrhage into the cerebellum that is the most common uh, culprit for having a vascular cause of acute cause of central vertigo vestibular neuritis is another cause of continuous spontaneous vertigo here it does not have any triggering uh, movement trigger triggering agent or head movement is not precipitating its uh, um, vertigo so most of the patient will have kind of an infectious cause they may having acute uri a viral infection or maybe they have recovered from a viral infection but they will tend to have a good hearing does not have any tinnitus but they have positive head impulses peripheral type of nystagmus absence few they have gait instability and in case of herpes zoster which is presenting with vestibular neuritis which is also common we can have uh, cutaneous vesicles which is over its pinna or over its uh, palate or over its lips etc there are some drug which is also drugs which has caused can cause uh, continuous and triggered uh, dizziness uh, multiple drugs are being uh, positive for this anti epileptics anti depressants cardiovascular multiple causes i am not going into the list so when is when we do, when do we require a brain imaging in form of mri not a ct ct is very not very not at all sensitive for detecting a acute cerebellar stroke or whenever you are suspecting we should always get an mri preferably by a diffusion weighted mri so whenever we are suspecting the nystagmus is atypical like a central vertigo type nystagmus we are getting the bi directional vertical skew present and there are some focal neurological signs present like cerebellar signs hemi sensory sensory loss a patient can have ataxia dysmetria other cerebellar sign positive and have a position vertigo which does not resolve with repeated therapeutic maneuvers and patient still continues to have dizzy even after one week of uh, therapeutic maneuver in all these cases we should go for an mri and our sus point of and our sus doubt will be more when a patient is having another risk factor for a vascular disease and is an old patient so this is how we approach a patient like history examination and go for a testing and there are some uh, few points which i need to want to mention here like uh, duration of vertigo dizziness is also important like whether it is having a short medium or a long duration bbpv perilin fistula and uh, superior semi circular dehiscence uh, which is also otolaryngology causes which can have a very short duration of uh, vertigo and medium causes will be like minier syndrome which is characteristically more than 20 minutes some cardiac arrhythmia or hypoglycemia seizure and vestibular migraine and peripheral neuropathy will have long cause i mean long duration of a uh, uh, dizziness there are some precipitating factor they already mentioned like change in position of head will be bpbv and uh, acute sudden sound like superior semi circular dizziness can have a patient exposed to loud sound and he is developing a vertigo or a dizziness and some vestibular migraine where they are allergic to some particular food or allergy or intense light or something they can have a vestibular migraine and uh, patients with pedilin fistula that means the inner ear and the middle ear is communicating there is a communication between the inner and middle ear maybe post trauma or maybe post surgery or having a barotrauma etc in that case pressure like coughing or a weight lifting can have a vertigo sensation and trauma post uh, uh, perilymphatic fistula and relieving factor normally vestibular migraine when you're sitting in the dark room in a quiet room they may be getting better with uh, as the time progresses and few other concomitant histories like uh, history of hospitalization and patient has been uh, given some vestibular toxic drugs like uh, given aminoglycoside antibiotic it can have a vestibular toxicity and history of uri as i said uh, herpes or some infection which can have vestibular neuritis even that can precipitate bppv from our infection or an ear surgery as i said before stressful event or a menarche and a neck pain or cervicogenic vertigo this i already mentioned associated symptoms and past history and family history also we need to ask the patient like any relevant cardiac history any relevant vascular disease anemia either before hypoglycemia maybe a diabetes mellitus patient having hypoglycemic attack or a past history of surgery history of barotrauma air travel and hematological causes and there will be some family history familial autosclerosis minier disease migraine can running families and some syndromic causes like char syndrome usher syndrome cogan syndrome etc can have a vertigo as a percentage so a patient presents with an acute vertigo 
and to rule out the peripheral causes, we should ask the patient about the migraine symptoms. Whether the patient is having migraine or not, we would can say patient is having a vestibular migraine here, but patient does not have a migraine symptom, then we should ask whether patient is having a hearing loss or not. So in case of hearing loss positive, whether they have an episodic vertigo or a non-episodic vertigo. So patients with hearing loss having an episodic vertigo will be having meniasis. Patient with hearing loss with negative uh, episode without having does not have an episodic continuous vertigo, that will be labyrinthitis. But the patient does not have an hearing loss. He had an episodic vertigo that is typically BPPV, but in case of hearing loss is not the having a not con having a continuous vertigo, he may be having a vestibular neuritis. That means vestibular neuritis presents with presence without hearing loss, labyrinthitis, which presents with hearing loss. But both are uh, continuous. This is the typical differentiation between the two. And Meniere's disease and BPPV both will be episodic, but hearing loss will be present in a Meniere's disease, and hearing loss may not be present in a BPPV. And few uh, discussion regarding benign paroxysmal postural vertigo, which is the most common vertigo that a patient can have. So this is a benign cause. Patient can have a paroxysmal burst of vertigo upon head movements. Autoconia, that the calcium carbonate crystal, which is situated in the uvicular saccule, are the main culprit for the having a patient having a benign paroxysmal vertigo. That means this autoconia debris can dislodge from its location and can move about within its endolymphophis semicircular canal can uh, produce a vertigo sensation. So changes in the head position is with respect to gravity actually causes this abnormal displacement of uh, this cupola, that is that uh, sensory organ within the semicircular canal and uterine, and they can have a simulation of this. Stimulation is a vestibular system. The two theories of BPPV, I'm not going into the detail, cupola lithiasis and canal lithiasis. Most common theory will be canal lithiasis. That means that uh, Autoconian debris have shifted, displaced from his uh, uterine saccule. It is floating within that endolymph that is causing him having an intense vertigo. So our uh, diagnosis, how to diagnose a dysphalpy, how to treat a patient depends on this canal lithiasis theory. Symptoms said is a vertigo, most common will be posterior sensory canal. And it's not commonly age related, not, not age related, commonly seen in uh, old age patients 50 to 70. Young patient can have post head trauma when they have a sudden uh, uh, endolymphatic fluid movement within the ear and which can cause a displacement of autoconia. And a lot of uh, etiology causes like uh, head trauma, most common causes. Vestibular neuritis can present with BPPV in that uh, the resolution stage, other multiple causes. So diagnosis is typically done by a dysphalpic maneuver. When you are suspecting a patient having acute vertigo, having a spinning sensation, which is precipitated by his head movement, continuous spinning sensation with the nausea and vomiting, you should always do a dysphalpic test to confirm whether he is having an acute vertigo. So dysphalpic test, you most of them may be aware of this test, like uh, we turn the patient, we ask the patient to sit on a couch and turn his head to 45 degree, and suddenly you bring back the patient to his lying down position with his head hanging from the edge of the couch, like, 20 degree, and we keep the head there for 20 to 30 seconds to look for nystagmus or whether the patient is having any subjective symptoms or not. In case of this, dixolpic is typically for its posterior semicircular canals and having a uh, dislodged orthoconia within the semicircular canal. We can see a nystagmus and uh, having a subjective symptoms of vertigo when doing a dixolpic. So if a patient is having a dixolpic positive, we should always do a Canalolith uh, repositioning maneuver. That means the dislodged autoconia, we need to bring them back to his uh, usual position, that towards his uh, uteric and saccule area. How do we do it? Like a please maneuver. I mean, we the first a please first step of a please maneuver is same as the Dixolpic test. I mean, we bring we suddenly bring back the patient to the edge of the couch with head hanging 20 degree and keep it there for 30 seconds. So the autoconia start moving within the posterior semicircular canal. Then we sh suddenly shift the head to 90 degrees the other side so that it moves a bit more forward. Keep that position for another 30 seconds. And then we ask the patient to turn again 90 degrees to the contralateral side. Keep the position for 30 seconds and ask the patient to sit up. And so that the uh, dislodged orthoconia can reach its uh, usual position.
So this at least maneuver or this canal with this repositioning is the best, I mean, the, the management for BPPV. I mean, most of the patient comes with BPPV to our uh, general OPD and we say if we're having a vertigo, we have a tendency to give them like beta histine, maybe a vertin or a vertistar or whatever, 8 mg, 16 mg. We don't do a, a please maneuver and patient will not be getting benefit with that. So you always, we should do a please maneuver or a canal with this repulsion maneuver that would only give a 100%, not, not exactly 100%, 70 to 80% recovery to the patient. Because BPPV have a tendency to have a recurrence. 20 to 30% of the patient can have recurrent BPPV. So patient may get benefit with one, uh, one episode of Eplis maneuver. One week later, the patient come, comes to with spinning sensation. You do the Eplis again, the patient can have a complete relief of that because it is known for high recurrence rate. So these all articles are saying, I mean, I go through from the PubMed, they all say is the Eplis maneuver is the, the uh, management for a BPPV. And does beta histine, uh, sorry, uh, there are some contraindications for replace, like patient having a severe uh, cervical or a neck pain or problem, we can't do that uh, sudden uh, uh, head movement, like bringing the patient to the edge of the table and hanging the head and all. And patient can have a vertebral basal heart disease, I mean, artery can have narrow artery or some pathology in the vertebral basal system, or having a carotid stenosis and all, we are like, uh, it's a prone for uh, occlusion of the one side of this carotid artery it can have uh, ischemia and all after this uh, Eplis maneuver. So in this kind of a situation, we try to avoid doing an Eplis uh, maneuver. So can actually this beta histine that is a vertin, that is a common brand name that we all are aware of, and other vestibular sedatives are indicated for BPPV. Vestibular sedatives like uh, Proclopracin and Sinaracin, etc. can be given to a patient with acute vertigo to have a Symptoms resolution, maybe one or two doses the max. Because acute vertigo patient having a peripheral vertigo, you should not continue the patients with this vestibular sedative. You shouldn't give him stomatal, you shouldn't give him stenera. Stomatal is the brand name. Shouldn't give the prochloroplasin for a long time. Shouldn't give sinaracin for a long time, which will actually prevent the body's compensation for a peripheral uh, vestibular vertigo. We can give him, when a patient comes with severe vertigo, we give him injection prochloroplasin and the patient gets better with his vertigo, patient has gets better with his vomiting as a symptom resolution alone. But beta histine people have studied their role. They have said that along with canal repulsion manner, only with canal repulsion manner, single, along with canal repulsion manner, beta histine can have an adjuvant effect on preventing the recurrence of BPPV, preventing the second episode of BPPV. But beta histine alone may not help a patient with BPPV. Always we should be given with the canal repulsion maneuver. The dose may vary from 24 to 32 mg per day, seven to 10 days, not more than that mostly. And this is a simple exercise which we used to treat our patients in, uh, when they uh, gets better with their acute vertigo. That's exercise called brand and of uh, positional exercise which can be done at our home. I mean, when the patient is free of his acute symptoms, we're able to move set to prevent any further recurrence, we can ask the patient to do it. It's a simple exercise. Like uh, we ask the patient to sit on a couch, turn his head to a 45 degree to one side, and suddenly ask the patient to lie down on this side, keep this position for 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, he comes back to normal and sit straight for another 30 seconds, then turn his head to another other side, 45 degree, and lie down on the opposite side again 30 seconds. This exercise can easily be done uh, without causing much of the vertigo. Initially, they have a problem with vertigo. So we ask the patient to do it one or two times. So ideally it should be done at least five times, three times a day for continuous for two weeks to prevent any further attacks of vertigo. Five to 10, ten minutes total exercise. So another small point regarding like in a, at like BPPV, this is an episodic vertigo, triggered episodic dizziness and triggered dizziness. Orthostasis, this high, postural hypotension. It also can produce an episodic and a triggered uh, uh, dizziness, not a vertigo, dizziness, because patient lying down for a long time, patient try to stand up. I and mean, if patient sitting for a long time, patient try to stand up, patient can have postural hypotension. So it's typically seen in old patient, patient having uh, other autonomic dysfunction, maybe due to a diabetic neuropathy. Patient is on antihypertensive medications. And this is triggered by a sudden postural change. So this is typically diagnosed by patient clinical history. We ask the patient whether you are feeling dizzy when you 
get up after lying down for a long time and you get up after sitting for a long time so we can easily measure is systolic bp in a lying down and a standing or a sitting position if there is a 20 mm mercury fall in systolic bp so we can identify if we having a postural hypotension so patient will feel dizzy they will not feel a, a spinning sensation in this case another entity is a meniere's disease which is the case in the inner ear disorder can produce with uh, Uh, this combines with three important symptoms like episodic vertigo they can have a fluctuating hearing loss and they presents with fluctuating oral symptoms like uh, ear fullness they can have fluctuating tinnitus etc and by definition it's an idiopathic condition and without having any cause like an endolymphatic hydrops that means there's a pressure inside the endolymph is increasing that can cause is vertigo symptoms there may be other secondary causes which is called a meniere syndrome maybe other like causes like syphilis trauma or autoimmune disorders and a patient with hypothyroidism patient with diabetic mellitus patient with horn uh, cardiovascular drugs that can lead to many as diseases age of onset is more commonly reported in the second or the sixth decade of life and it can also be seen in a pediatric population there is no difference between female to male ratio in majority of the cases it is estimated to be familial 5 to 15% can have a familial cause so etiology as such i said endolymphatic hydrop that means pressure inside the endolymph is increasing they can have autoimmune factors and post viral infection maybe or an allergic factor metabolic factor or vascular factors so definition as such meniere disease is actually a episodic vertigo presents with hearing loss and they have a two definitive episodes of vertigo they usually have a long duration of vertigo it will typically last more than 20 minutes bp bp last for maximum of 1 minute and this meniere disease last for more than 20 minutes the patient will be lying down for more than 20 minutes and it can even last up to 12 hours to 24 hours and apart along with that definitive episode of vertigo they should have a hearing loss he should have an audiometry done to have his hearing loss documented they typically have a low to medium frequency uh, sensor in order hearing loss and patient can have a fluctuating oral symptoms like patient can have hearing tinnitus or ear fullness if all these conditions satisfy then we can call the patient is having a meniere's disease so meniere's disease is actually the condition in which vestibular sedatives uh, sorry uh, in, in the condition in which beta histamine can actually help this kind of patients and even diuretic have a help in this diuretics like uh, hydrochlorothiazide acetazolamide dimoxibranin that we normally give it can actually decrease the endolymphatic pressure It, which can provide a benefit to the patient and they reduce the endolymphatic volume and pressure beta histamine by its mechanism of uh, increasing the blood flow to inner ear it increases the blood flow to inner ear so it is also has shown a benefit in patient with meniere disease we can use a tapering doses of uh, uh, beta histamine by based on the patient response by starting the treatment and along with that they should have a good dietary restriction like you should ask the patient to cut down his salt intake he should avoid high salt food and you should ask the patient to abstain from coffee and tea which can also increases the uh, endolymphatic pressure so other treatments are also been tried like intratymanic injection like uh, corticosteroid and gentamicin which normally we give when a patient doesn't get better with this lifestyle modification doesn't get better with uh, beta histamine or diuretic when you reach the maximum dose of that then we can by discussing with the patient we can give either a corticosteroid or we can even give a gentamicin though gentamicin carries a risk of uh, uh, his worsening of his hearing status so these are two other uh, no invasive method we can give the patient another important entity is a vestibular migraine which is also very commonly seen in our practice like patient will have a typically have a Uh, migraine history in the past either in the past or currently they have five episodes of vestibular symptoms for moderate to severe intensity which is lasting for 5 minutes to 72 hours they have a migraine uh, according to the international headache society classification if migraine features are present with more than 50% of the attacks headache with two or unilateral throat, moderating headache they have photo or phonophobia they have vomiting and they have visual aura and they are not better accounted by any other disorder 
So this is the diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine. In case of a vestibular migraine patient, we give them vestibular sedative for a few days I and mean, not for a prolonged time. And we give the patient for acute headache, we give them a painkiller in form of an NSAID or a uh, triptans. Or we give, put the patient on a prophylactic medication to prevent a migraine, like a beta blockers or a topiramate or et cetera. And another entity here is a chronic subjective dizziness, which is actually comes under the non-specific dizziness, which you have seen in the first, in the, in the initial few slide. And another way is called as a geriatric dizziness syndrome, which is the dizziness which is being uh, felt by most of the patients more than 60 or 65 ages. They have multiple myriads of symptoms they usually have. They have subjective unsteadiness and giddiness. They can have a hypersensitivity to motion. I mean, they're sitting in a car and the car is moving. They feel like the entire world is spinning around them or they're not able to sit properly, like a motion sickness kind of a syndrome. And they can even have a visual dizziness. So this chronic subjective dizziness. <laughs> and last but most important thing is the vestibular rehabilitation exercises. Whenever we know that the patient comes with vertigo and a peripheral process or a central process, we have treated the patient to prevent the patient from further attack <clears throat> and to have a patient have a normal and a life, we should ask to have a vestibular rehabilitation exercise. The, and the name is called a Cothron Coxie exercise, which is a simple exercise with eyes, with its neck movement, with its shoulder movement, and uh, to make the patient adjust to their day to day movements, which can precipitate a vertical, uh, vertigo attack. And ask the patient to be on this vestibular rehabilitation exercise for at least a month or two to prevent its further attack or a good quality of life. When I am positioned vertically, it is a very common problem. So, what you are actually doing is not medical, because you have regular medicals. We can also, as I said, we can ask the patient to do a home and place manual. See, uh, another question manual that we do in our OPD, we can ask the patient to do it. Though they are feeling pretty goody while doing it, at home when they are doing it. They might feel very distant, very easy, and they might not be. You can actually ask the patient to perform a place now. And you can ask the patient to set up and turn the vector for the fatigue and keep a pillow or something behind his shoulder so that he can uh, keep his head uh, hanging from that horizontal uh, level. Keep that position for uh, 30 seconds and turn his head to 90 to one side for the shoulder. The same that a place manual that we do in OPT, we can ask the patient to work. Otherwise, another simple technique that we can see the patient that we are feeling in PD with the BPD, ask the patient to lie down. Most of them have a tendency to close their eyes. It should be close their eyes. Because peripheral vertigo as such, they stand as anything, they have a visual fixation. So you ask the patient to open his eyes, although they might feel very easy or business, but by try to fixate his eyes to one particular point in 20 to 30 seconds, most of the time patient gets better. If doesn't they get better? So they can come to it. Second of all, I would like to, on behalf of Kanwar I would like to thank Dr. Ashwin for presenting a very beautiful presentation. Actually, he has put so many points, I think I have to go through the recorded version also to catch all those points. And he has explained the pathophysiology and the case scenarios with that. And I thank all the IMA members who has taken part in this meeting, has come in.
uh, in spite of their busy schedule. I also thank Mr. Sanal Raj, who has been managing all the audiovisual effects and our online streaming. And also the scientific committee members who have uh, selected the topic and the app topic and app speaker also. Thank you all for the coming here for this weekly CME meeting. Thank you.